Welcome to today's episode of your Turning Point series. Today, we have the pleasure of having Mr. Lee Bundy to talk to us about his turning points. Lee has helped countless world-class athletes, including Olympians and CEOs of multi-million dollar companies to be the best versions that they want to be. Uh, Lee is the founder and director of Team Lee Sport Australia, Team Lee Sport International, and the Ultimate Pro Experience. And he has led more than 20, 20, 29 life-changing inner mind world transformational retreats in Bali, Melbourne, and Los Angeles in the US. He is also the certified NLP master practitioner. And he has also been an accomplished athlete having played college basketball in the US in his early years. Uh, um, to arrive at what he is at today, he has overcome tremendous amount of challenges and odds along the way. So today I'm really pleased to have Lee share with us uh, his nuggets of wisdom and so to speak, we want to pick his brain. I met Lee right, about a month ago, slightly more than a month ago at the TED conference mm -hmm. at uh, Docklands in Melbourne. And I must say that his talk has actually uh, captiv captivated me ever since. So uh, I'm mm -hmm. really, very happy to have you make time for me and our listeners so that we can learn more about this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, it was great meeting you. You know, you're a true gentleman. Um, you know, I know that the times haven't been that flexible, but you're very flexible and very understanding. So, you know, I appreciate it. So I love, love working with people like yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You've been very generous. Thanks for your kind words. So would you like to uh, start with uh, briefly uh, share with us, uh, you know, your, your, you know, early years, like yep. growing up as a boy and then, you know, yes. Yep. So you, you would have um, heard a, a lot of it, or bits of it, at the TED talk that um, I've, I've I've been I've been <laughs> been facing and really, you know, devoted to changing my life because I've been not forced to, but since I've been a young boy, I've had challenges of um, you know being born with only twenty percent hearing, uh, and and you know being told to to start to live to wear hearing aids and that you know I'm not going to be able to hear. And to start to understand from a, you know, an early age of five, thinking that there's something wrong with me and developing all these limitations, developing all these layers, you know, I spoke funny. So what I mean by funny is different because any, you know, when you can't hear, you talk like this because you can't hear. And a lot of people, um, you know, they used to make fun of me. I had, I had close people close to me. I had um, family friends. Uh, you know, I even, you know, at school, it was, I was always bullied. And it was at that age, I didn't really know what was right, what was wrong, but they were already, um, you know, I really felt behind the eight ball. I felt the diversity already then. Um, so I was, I was excluded from a lot of social events. I wasn't a popular kid, so to speak. And, um, you know, the sporting, you know, I, because I couldn't really hear and I didn't really believe in myself, you know, I wouldn't really participate in any, any of the physical education. I would just sort of sit there and blend in and let everyone else do their thing. And, and you know, I was that, that outsider. But I come, to, I come to an understanding where I didn't want to do something in me that I didn't want to live that limiting belief of having the hearing aids or believe that I was going to be deaf. There was just something in me. I don't know where it come from. Like I, I was only five years old. I haven't read, you know, a thesis on, you know, on the new technology of, of hearing or whatever it might be or mindset. I didn't even know what that meant until 12 years ago. And now I'm 38, so you do the math. Um, the interesting thing was, I saw, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a one-eye Collingwood supporter and I saw how these sporting stars, how they were respected and they looked like, you know, they, wow, Superman. And I also saw this guy that could fly through the air and Michael Jordan. I'm like, oh my God, look at them. They look so powerful. Like, and I said to my mum, you know, would these guys be, you know, would these guys need to hear mum or could they just, you know, and she said, no, they probably, you know, to do that. I said, wow, look at them. Look at everyone. You know, they see these people as superstars. And it gave me an idea and I wanted to become that. I mean, wow, maybe, maybe that's, what, that's why I'm here. And, and I said to my mum, I go, can I do that? And she said, you can do anything you want, you know? And then you know, it always brings a bit of a tear to my eye. So then I devoted myself from five to 10 onwards of, you know, how do I, how do I, you know, how do I become that footballer? You know, kicking a footballer, running, training, you know? And I started doing weights. 
I think when I was 10 years old, running and putting a backpack on with the Rocky music, you know, because I know you like Rocky Balboa as well. And, um, you know, I, I love Rocky for all the training music. And, and even, even back then, it was, you know, I think I was around 10, I think, when Rocky was always, you know, rock and rolling and it was John Van Damme and all that stuff was happening. And I remember my first weight set was from um, a Hulk Hogan weight set, you know, from the wrestling WWF, I think it was back then. Yes, Hogan, yes. So I, I, I devoted and had a, um, it was almost an unhealthy obsession about training. And because as I grew, I started to become, you know, people started to notice me. I, you know, they didn't have any option because I was that sports star. I was that, I was that athlete. And one of the things I would say, I was born with chronic asthma. And back then they didn't have all the whiz bang vapors and, you know, all, all the, um, the, you know, the Ventolin and all the rest of it, it was more that you had, it was a tablet that you'd crush and then you'd have to breathe it in. And I don't know how effective it was back then, but from 10 to 12, I, I had a growth spurt and my body, um, it, it grew enormous from being five foot something. I grew to six foot around five from 10 to 12. And during that time, my hearing, like my asthma and that went because obviously doing a lot of the um, cardio and the, you know, VO2 max, my lungs grew, um, obviously the fitness, and because I was creating that identity of being this um, athlete, this superior human, you know, specimen, it does, yes, it does change the ideas, but the body grew with it as well. And, but through that time, if I didn't mention, I was, like I said, I was bullied. I was bashed when I was younger. I was, um, I was um, actually isolated from a lot of social events. And I remember I went to receive an award one of the times and I actually didn't know this. And I don't know if I mentioned to you when we spoke last that, you know, in a big assembly, so there's about 3000 students. Yeah. And you get up to take an award and they dap me and I got dapped to the part. They pulled down my shorts and my underpants. So everything was shown. And I remember I did, I did a lot of work on myself about why was I scared of public speaking? Why was I, there was something there. And I remember that I had a subconscious connection to, to that incident. So yeah, every time I'd go up, my brain was going, oh, something's going to happen. And until I worked on that, and now, you know, what we'll get into later, how I overcome everything, um, I, I re, um, you know, I reprogrammed my mind. So from, from 12 to 14, I grew even more to how tall I am today. I'm about 190 centimeters, which is six foot two and a half. And I was very athletic. From, and then I was obviously playing in a lot of the sporting, a lot of the clubs in basketball around, around Victoria. I was playing VBL for uh, Craigie Byrne. Then I played, um, you know, I played for a lot of selective teams. Um, during that, I was, you know, I was a young boy and I was playing in the seniors. Also, at the same time, I was playing senior level football. So I love Collingwood. I was playing at the Calder Cannons, Western Jets, um, you know, for the Victorian team. And, you know, so I was playing at the of basketball and football and I was and I was drawn like what do I do you know but and I remember I would play a whole I would have a whole coaching or a, a training session on Sunday of basketball then I'll go and play a whole game of football and I was oh. it was it was crazy and um you know, just during that, my dad wanted me to obviously play football, but I love basketball. And I went over on a tour over to America and we played against all these other colleges. And I ended up getting picked up by a high school where um, they, they were called Perry Desheen, Cedar Rapids, which is near Iowa, Wisconsin. And then I got picked over to go to a college. And, you know, that's um, here I am, 14, 15 years old, 1994, 1995. And, you know, not you don't even really know, like you're just finding yourself out and, it made me grow up a lot. Um, living in America, being involved in that as well, it was uh, it was interesting. And what, one of the things to come, like even now, I went deeper with that part of the story. I was very, it was very hard to be accepted at back in that time from an Australian coming through to America. The, they, they because the thing is, an Australian coming over taking a spot for the Americans, and in the small country towns of Iowa, Wisconsin. You know, it was quite hard at the start until I almost like I had to prove myself again, like when I was five years old, like I had to prove that, you know, I was worthy. And so during, during that time of playing sport and, 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 I, and, I, and I, was getting, I was getting the trophies, I thought, you know what, I would, I, would be, I, I would be okay with myself. And there's obviously, I expressed myself with no limitations when I was playing. So even even when I was I was playing a lot of sport, I was involved with you know you know you're respected as a person of influence. The social aspect was you know that's I couldn't communicate. If there was family functions, I would just stay with myself. You know, just listen to music or you know play PlayStation or something like that. And it was interesting because 
you know, obviously at that stage as well, my parents are going, okay, when I came back from America, you need to get, you need to get a work, you know, you need to start making some money. So my first job was at Kmart and it was, you know, very, initially it was very hard for me at the start and was uncomfortable, but then I made a lot of friends there. I made a lot of connections, but I always knew there was something bigger and better out there for me. And I didn't want that. I knew that here I had these managers and even at a young age, I had these managers that I would look at, but I had no respect for because they've, they've been in this job. They didn't know how to lead. They weren't empowering me in any way. And I always knew, even when I was five years old, and then I, know, I knew I was destined for, you know, uh, for greatness. And I always thought that I was trapped and limited. And it was always, it just didn't feel right. You felt like you're in prison. So... In that time period as well, I discovered partying and women and going out and eat. During Melbourne back then, there was a lot of, you know, when I say when there was drug taking, it didn't affect me or destroy my life. It was more of a, a lovey-dovey time. It wasn't like now how the ice epidemic's really bad. I'm not saying I condone it, but it was just like, it was just, it was a, it was a, a time when I say, you know what, it was a good, it was, it was a good experience. Um, so... In that life, it's a bit of a bubble as well. So it's like what goes up must come down and, you know, you can't just keep partying all your life. So it was a great experience. You saw a lot of, you know, good things, saw a lot of, you know, interesting things. Um, and it gives, you, it gives you that awareness. But then again, you know, you have to come back to reality. And coming back to reality was a little bit hard for me from, from you know, partying and enjoying myself. And then I had to go in to do boring things. And then yes. my parents, what are, you, what are you doing? Like then I went, oh. I have to go into a, you know, into a job again. So, you know, from 14, 18 and early twenties, I bounced around from, um, you know, different retail um, shops and suit shops and this and that. And I really hated it because, you know, you work say Monday or Monday I normally had off because I think I was still recovering from the weekend, say Tuesday to Tuesday to Tuesday to Thursday, you know, you're recovering, you start to feel good to Thursday again, Friday. And then Saturday, you know, you're back into the, back into the party um, swing of things. And that was, a, that was a very sort of vicious cycle because um, you know, obviously you're not applying yourself. And at the same time, I still was playing sport and I still would train, um, you know, and that, that was the thing that really kept me sane as well. Still doing the training um, because it kept me fit, kept me disciplined, kept me healthy. And, you know, but then I'm looking at what, why am I wanting to do this? Why am I wanting to have this fast paced life? And I'm like, I can't, this is not going to keep going forever. So it's just like, you know, what's next? What, what, what's my path? So eventually, um, you know, I came up with the conclusion, my dad came up with the conclusion, you know, to get a trade, to work as a, to work as a tradie. And the thing was that that was probably the, one of the worst mistakes for me anyway that I could have made in my life because working as a trade, if anyone knows in the trading environment and that, uh, the bullying is very, very, it's very aggressive there. Um, you know, it's not like they have the greatest standards. You know, they're not there to empower you. They just want to get their money. Um, a lot of the tradies, they've got that mentality that, you know, we're not smart, we're just good with our hands and, you know, and they've got this chip on their shoulder and they're not all the same, but then it's generational. And unfortunately, I got put with, um, one of my dad's friends allowed me to work at a certain company where I was going to do my electrical apprenticeship. And straight away from even there and dad's friend, that was, it was just, well, uh, not me, I felt trapped because you have to remember when, when I wasn't there, I had a lot of friends that owned a lot of nightclubs, a lot of bars. There was a lot of quite powerful people. You know, you felt like you felt like a little bit of a superstar, you know, that, you know, you're enjoying life. You, you know, you're, you're having nice things. They had big, big houses, pool parties, boat parties, driving around in their Porsches and Ferraris. And I'm like, I don't need this materialistic things, but I like this life because it's the way it made me feel. It made me feel you're respected. You're around people that, you know what, it looks like they're doing good things with their life. They didn't, they weren't, always challenging and, and, and there wasn't bullying. You're accepted, you were loved, you were appreciated. So as, as I was going, you know, obviously up the ranks and I was, I was in my, um, I was in my early, early to mid 20s, so I was an adult apprentice. Um, and I was, I was bullied to a point where, you know, they, I was like I was a peasant, like a slave, clean this up, do that. And here I am a, a lot bigger now, you know, I'm 28 years old, I think, or I, think I was. Um, you know, I'm a big guy running around, you know, I've got some connections with some really, you know, mean and nasty people. And, you know, and, and, and it's just like, hold on a minute, I, I'm, I'm sitting here and it's like I'm torturing myself. And I remember I used to go, I started to build up a complex where I used to started to have anxiety when I had to go to work. 
and then I'm just waiting for things to happen. And then how I start, started to shut off when I was young because I couldn't hear, I started to do it again when I was 28. And it really, even thinking about it, it was just so unnecessary because of the bullying. And, you know, even when I would go to talk, people would cut me off, clean this. I said, look, I'm not a cleaner. I'm here to learn. Well, you have to go up the ranks and blah, blah, blah. You know, to a point I, I, got, I, I, I felt afraid and I, and I had to stick up for myself. And then I had to become the bully. So not that I had to, I chose to be the bully. I chose to, I chose to stand up for myself to say, hey, no, you're not going to do that, you know, and, and, and physically push back. You know, with some of the guys, with that, it did it come into a point where I said, if you keep doing that, mate, I'm going to end up punching your face in. And, and, I, and I did. And, I, you know, and, and then the police were called and I said, mate, I've had enough of these guys doing this to me. You know, the thing is, I've got access to so many people that I can make these guys go away very quickly. And that's, and, you know, that's, no one wants to talk like that. And that's, that's the conditioning because I had enough of suppressing the feeling, suppress. It's like, imagine being slapped in the face, bang, 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 bang. And you're going to get to a point. Do you know what I mean? It's, um, yeah. and it's quite interesting that, you know, when you see the movies and you see the young kid in the school, in the schoolyard and, and you see him getting hit and he, and then he learns how to do karate, like karate kid. And he goes, well, I'm going to learn how to do karate. And I did, I learned how to do Taekwondo. And, I'm, and I think you've done Taekwondo as well. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. For a while. Yeah. And, you know, and, 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 and I thought, you know what, like, and I did do Taekwondo for that because there was another sport I wanted to be, you know, like Bruce Lee or John Van Damme. And, um, and I remember that, you know, you see that kid and when that kid fights back and he punches the bully in the nose, then the bully goes, oh, I got hit in the nose. And that was exactly what was happening here. And it's, and it got to a point where, you know, what, I want to teach these people a lesson. If people are going to do wrong by people, I want to teach them a lesson. And it was the wrong energy. It was vindictive. It was vengeance. It was anger. And then I started surrounding myself with other people that, you know, that we thought we were powerful and, you know, getting involved in gangs and getting involved in some nasty stuff. You know, we, you know, I was sort of like, F the world. I'm going to push back. Like, if you're going to do that, like people would cut me off in their car, chase them down, rip them out of, you know, they'll give you the finger. And then I think, for what? For what? You know, you can't, you can't change everyone's life. Just don't become reactive to them. So as this was happening and I went and I moved from different electrical apprenticeships and the rest of it, I went through a certain job where I was supposed to go nine months and obviously nine months on the tool. So hands on. And as, I, as that was going on, I was doing my uh, schooling. And when it came to the time to be signed off for the nine months, so I could get qualified for my schooling. I finished everything in my schooling over the three years, uh, whatever it was. But then we come to the point where, I had to be qualified and I found out they didn't have me on the books. It was all, they were doing a, a, an illegal, was, was dodgy. And when it came to it, they go, mate, look, and I said, hold on a minute. You just stuffed up my career. I've got one more, I've got one more exam to do until I get qualified and you haven't had me on the books. And the way they handled it was, you know what, that's just the way it is, mate. I don't know about it. Get out of here. I said, mate, I'm about to. And during this time, I was with a girl and we're planning to get married. So, you know, here I am. Okay, I finally got my shit together. I've settled down. I found a girl, and in this period, we we had a place where we we're going to move into in um, the northern suburbs. And I was living in Richmond, so I was renting in Richmond, and we had the build up that was renting the house out. So it was working really well. When this happened, I didn't have the job. Instead of having support, and I was basically kicked on my ass. And I remember this day very clearly. That I asked the, I asked the person, and I've actually it's quite interesting. I'll tell you a story because I've seen him very recently. And, and I said to him, you know, and I'm basically crying, begging, going, look, I've got, you know, I've got, I'm about to get married, mate, look, this is going to dis destroy me. And he goes, mate, stop in there. This is my way it is. Go man up, stop with your shit. Rah, rah, rah. He goes, oh, that's the way the cookie crumbles. And then he goes, I remember he takes me into the, um, the factory and in front of about 50 of the guys, hey guys. You know, Lee's having a bit of a soup because there's no work for him anymore. Does anyone have anything to do? Sweep the floor, you know, pick up your dog shit or something like that. And I remember he said that. And I looked at him and I just wanted to, honestly, I was looking at something to literally do some very damage. Like, you know, when the, it just gets that much and all that pain from the bullying and, and that just come up. Yes. And I've gone, wow. And I said to him, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see you. I'm going to see you again. And you better cross the road, you know? And to a point, 
when I when I when I voiced this out to my certain people, we got to even a point where you know what we we actually put a plan together, which wasn't going to be too good. Do you know what I mean? It was just silly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know that's all I'll pretty much say. But it, it took me to such, or I allowed it to take me to such a dark place. And you know that's when you see people in America when they stuff like this happens, they've got access to guns. You know, and then they'll just go, you know what, fuck it, I've had enough, boom, 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 go on. And, and you know, people just get pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And if they don't know the tools like I know now, they do silly things. So during the breakup, there was a lot of stress. Um, you know, through that process, Ken, um, you know, if I, if I fast forward a little bit, the, my, my, uh, first, my first engagement or relationship uh, broke up. It wasn't great, didn't have the support. We just found out that the people that were renting out our house, they were supposed to rent out for two years. They said six months now, so we couldn't afford it. We had to stop renting in, in everything just happened all at once to a point where I could, you know what, I'm not getting the support from this, this, this person. Um, you know, here we've gone through that. And like, you think that you're going to be the mother of my children. Well, I called the wedding off, had to move out of the place, you know, early, early release lease, five to $10,000. Then there was the mortgage for the place that we had. And, and it was just a massive downward spiral where, you know, people say a mental breakdown. It just, just kept too much. And I didn't know the tools and I was pretty much homeless. I'm like, what am I going to do now? And I remember, I just, I, I can't even remember what happened when I moved from there, you know, then I had to leave there. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I slept even in the park for a night or something. My parents go, where are you? I didn't want to tell them what happened. So they said, well, come home, you know, and as I came, you know, I came to their beautiful place, you know, I'm blessed. And, you know, obviously that's where, I was brought up that, you know, it's a big kick between the legs when you think here you are, you want it, you're going to get married, everything is starting to go on and then you've just lost it all. So, um, you know, it's, it really came, you know, you think about it now, you think about, wow, geez, but it's a, it was a lesson. So in that period, um, I locked myself away. Um, it was about a six month to one year period. I put on a lot of weight. Um, and that's where the so-called depression kicked in. Negative thought, negative thought, just watching movies was just, you know, my mum would say, oh, look, you got this bill and you got that bill. I'm just, I'll do whatever. And, you know, and it just accumulated bill, lost a lot of money. Um, and it just wasn't nice. Like I remember even after I broke up with my ex fiance, never saw her again. It was just through text messages. I've seen her since just been around because since I've come back to Melbourne, but yeah, it was a really, it was a really dividing dark place in my life where I attempted to take my life three times. You know, my, my parents had to witness that. And, you know, that's where I really had a really good experience as people call it mental health, depression. And the really scary thing about that, Ken, is the doctors and support that I had made it even worse. They gave me the wrong antidepressants where I'm so against antidepressants. They gave it for, you know, this Cymbalta and it's, it's for schizophrenia. Cymbalta is the drug. And every thought that I felt, it just, just made it, if I felt sad, it would times it by 100. If I felt angry and... And, you know, and, I, and I've had those same thoughts now and different things and I've gone through those in my life and I've gotten through it way better than any drug. And, you know, yeah, it can numb you down and just switch you off, but it's such a, it's a bandaid and it's such a dark thing that it's the wrong treatment for such a um, delicate situation. So I, I come to a fork at the end of the road and, and you know, and I, and I said to myself, like, wh wh what do I want to do after this? I've put on all this way. I'm losing my life. I've attempted to take my life, stress with my parents. And I'm like, you know, I didn't ever think that I would, you know, that I'd recover. I'll never think that I would find love again. I never think that, you know, that I'll be physically fit or, or, or whatever. I didn't think that I could keep living. And, and during that time, you know, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to start hanging out with those people again to start feeling alive. So I started hanging out with the wrong people and drug dealers and other gangs and the rest of it. And, you know, oh, okay, let's have a party and all that. But I wasn't working because I needed to, to take the time off. And that was a quick fix. But, you know, yeah, you know, you're distracted by that. But I said, I need to get my life into, you know, and I, and I come to a fork at the end of the road and I, I'm end up going to end up being in a hole or behind bars or, or, you know, it's really like it wasn't a great and. So what happened was I, I spoke to one of my supervisors and I was working at the Crown Casino um, at that stage. I was doing electrical work and I was doing, um, and I was doing security. And they said, why didn't you start coming back? And obviously doing security and electrical, you need to make sure you've got proper, you know, mental health, <laughs> you know, well-being. Yeah. And during that process, um, you know, I, I met people that were exposed into self-development, um, NLP then. I didn't really know what it meant. Um, 
I met Jamie McIntyre and a lot of his, his crew got to um, go on his 40th birthday, which was in uh, Vegas. It was at the top of the Palms Casino, the Playboy Suite. And I met people like Paul Davies, who eventually came my NLP master practitioner. Oh, my coach. Um, there was Nick Halleck. Uh, they call him the thrillionaire or the billionaire. Like he's, you know, uh, there was Nick. There was obviously Lou Hardy. Um, there was Jamie. And there was, there was a number of people. I said, wow, well, I need to know more about this. So then Paul invited me um, to his program where I had to come up with, you know, it was thousands of dollars to do, uh, you know, NLP and then master prac. And that was in Cool and Ghetto. And look, it was, it was quite, that was the turning point. And I started to really understand, like, because I, I believed all my life I wasn't smart. I couldn't read. I, you know, I'm not meant to, you know, what am I going to give back to this world? I'm just going to fit in and just, you know, eventually just rot away. Um, and I knew that that wasn't me because I, I didn't want to fit in when I was a young boy playing sport. I always wanted to lead. I always wanted to inspire. And I really believe I've got a gift to be able to. I'm not better than anyone. I'm not worse than anyone. I just have something which I believe that I want to be able to give back, a strength, a billet, whatever it might be. Um, and then from that journey of, you know, finding, discovering myself of NLP, things started changing. I started getting, you know, what we call now emotional intelligence. Started feeling better about myself started feeling happier. Um, you know, then I attracted um, a, a, another uh, a lady into my life. And then through that journey, you know, I, I got out of that darkness and I went, wow. And I'm like, well, this is, you know, I want to help people. If I can get out of that low point, then I'm sure that, you know, there's men out there that can, um, you know, that can benefit from it. Yes. And uh, I believe it's about during that time, you also met uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger where you were given the assignment to bodyguard him. I think yes. it was in one of uh, J.B. McIntyre's events as well. So could you speak a little bit about that as well, like, you know, your encounter with Arnold and I believe yeah. he also had the, you know, you guys have spoken, right? Uh, something about life and, yeah, basically. Yep. So in that, in that time, um, I went, I remember it was quite funny. I, I went to go and see, um, I got invited because uh, the girl that I was with then was working with Jamie um, and she was, um, she was doing the presentation work. And I remember at that time, um, Arnold was going to be there. So I, I just went in at the start. I was a guest. I wanted a photo with him. And then one of the, um, one of the private big owners and uh, mentors of Jamie, I uh, said, look, Lee, can you, you know, you've got your security license. Can you, can you do the security bodyguard for Arnold? Cause when people, when he comes in, you know what, you can go and take him where he needs to go. And plus when people take the photo, can you please usher him on? Cause they just stay there. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that for sure. And in that time period of obviously doing that, got to, got to walk him out of the back, take him back to the green room and we had the conversation and um, you know, and he goes, he goes, young man, you know, what, what are you, what, what do you do? Like in, in certain words. And I said, what do you mean what I do? He goes, I can tell this is not what you just do. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you know, when you meet people, you go, I can tell. I said, oh, look, I've, um, I've just come from a journey and I'm, I'm wanting to give back. I've just discovered, you know, me coming from where I was. I didn't really say too much details and, you know, and I really come from a dark place and I want to be able to share that with people because I'm sure if there's not many people that's been as low as I have and that, that I can share this gift with them. And I always wanted to lead and coach. And at that time, I was doing a network marketing company and I was sort of like, okay, what did I want to do? And I went to Bali a few times. So there was a few things about, you know, going to Bali to live that lifestyle. And I remember what I was doing through, through that. I came up with an idea and I spoke to, um, and that's what I mentioned to Arnold. I said, look, I'm looking at starting a business. It's called Beast Mode Australia. He goes, what's the beast mode? You know, is it personal training? I said, no, it's when, when I was down and out, you know, it's in an NLP side of things, it's my, my procrastination strategy, my disempowering strategy was, you know, pretty much suicide. And then as you, as you have the different strategies to grow, my empowering strategy was beast mode. And I've got it in my book and I should show you one day. It's, I've got it. You can see it written and it's from, you know, from 12 years ago. And the interesting thing about it was, uh, and like, you know, to get, I want to get men into their, their ultimate state, their ultimate, you know, their ultimate masculine state. And that's what it was all about. The masculine energy was, you know, uh, leaders creating leaders, unleash your true masculine potential. And that was through what I discovered. And it wasn't like, geez, it's a catchy slogan. It's something that, you know, that I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to bring in the lives of other men. 
And I remember I spoke to Arnold about it. And then Arnold told me, as we were talking about, which I've never, ever heard of his story, was talking about when he was a young boy, you know, when how he went through his journey of being a farmer, wanting to be a bodybuilder, got over to America, become the best bodybuilder. And then from being a bodybuilder, you know, he wanted to be an actor. And they said, no, you know, because of your accent, then he's, then he, you know, what made him famous? I'll be back. You know, his accent made him the famous. Um, then from being that, he wanted to give back and have more power from after being an actor, become the governor. And he said, he goes, go, don't listen to anyone. Listen to yourself. Go against the grain. And I've always been that since I felt like not me being, you know, trying to be disruptive. It actually is disruptive, but I don't do it to ruffle any feathers. I just don't want to be like anyone else. I want to be, I want to be me. I'm not hurting anyone. And I remember from that talk, you know, and you see Arnold, like he didn't need to fit in. He didn't want to be like anyone else. And you see these other great leaders, they don't need to fit in. And the thing, and the, you know, the, the message that I say to yourself and to the, um, to the listeners is that you won't be accepted at the start. You won't be seen. You won't be understood. You won't be trusted. It takes time. But if you lose hope and then start to dwindle your, you know, your, your light or you stop shining or, you know, you feel like you're diluted or you, you lose vision and you lose the path because, yeah, you'll be knocked off. Yes, you'll have naysayers. Like you probably would have seen, Ken, um, it was very hard for me to do that TED Talk, to talk about what I did. And I had a public attack on there from people that I've grown up with, do you know? Like, and it was, and it was quite interesting that because I haven't seen these people for eight years. Their parents are very good friends of my parents and jealousy and all this stuff. And, that, and then they want to, you know, it could have been handled completely different. Get on a call, yeah. in an inbox. And it was quite interesting, you know, even that shiny time of something so fragile you know, people still want to chop you at your feet. And, yes. and, and I'll be honest with, you know, with you and the, and the listeners again, that I, I allowed myself to become weak for a little bit. I allowed myself to become reactive. I allowed myself to become angry, not on the messages, but afterwards. And I said, who the F are these people doing that? You know what I mean? And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, the old, the old bully come back, you know, because you know, you feel unsafe when you feel You want to you know you know if you want to find something with bullying. I think we've, you know, this, 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 this public stigma of the judgment and the, and the people picking on other people. It would save so many lives if we had more great leaders and people of the hatred to say, what well, you know what, that energy that you're going to put into thinking, hate me, you're going to make me stronger. You're going to make me bigger. You're going to make me smarter. You're going to make me more, you know, more able to create what I want. And you know what, 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 are, what are some haters going to say? What are those people going to say? They're going to be so small and insignificant. They're going to go, oh my God, I just created a monster. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I think one of the reasons why these naysayers they attack people like yourself is because, you know, you, you represent the message, the message that, you know, uh, we have it within us. You know, it's not because we lack the tools. Uh, it's not because we lack the skills or intelligence or yep. anything or any quality. It's whether we want to use them or not. Yes. So uh, people always like to pretend that they don't know the secret, so they can pretend they can continue giving, living in their excuses, you know. So, so I guess it's because of that they don't want to confront it themselves, and anyone who says that they will attack, regardless if <laughs> you know they are your friend or not, so-called friend, right? <laughs> yeah. And it was interesting. Like for one thing, you know, I don't have any enemies but even enemies wouldn't do it you know people that don't know you would do it it was really interesting that someone that even it was really funny that you grew up with and then even questioning her oh well i don't remember you having that human problem and then my, my mum's going are you serious it's like well hold on a minute you remember like even making assumptions like and their whole thing was you know the language that i used and my ted talk is called deaf dumb and bully i was called deaf which i pretty much was deaf i was called dumb all my life and i was bullied you know, and, and, and have, do you, like, do I need to, I'm not going to lie about that. I'm not sitting there calling people deaf and dumb and it was me, 
Yes, yeah? yes, that's okay. right, that's right. You're just saying it as it is. That was what you were called. Yes. That's the message you want to bring, bring out. Yeah. 100%. Yes, yes. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about like, um, you know, what, what you do at, you know, the Bismol International, Bismol Australia, and also the ultimate home flow experience? Yep, awesome. So, um, as time changes, you need to evolve. And through Beast Mode at the start, it was purely men's retreats and men one one coaching masterminds, and it was about unleashing that masculine energy, the leadership. And I then through that process become very successful running retreats over in Bali, a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching, creating these great um, these brotherhoods. I had a lot of women contacting me saying that, you know what, I, I want to be, you know, I love what you do. I don't want a fluffy coach. I need someone that says it straight. I need someone with your energy. So then I'm like, okay, cool. We started to allow women to come to the retreat. So then they were called beauties and the beast, you know, the beauties and the beast. Uh, and yeah. I'm like, hold on a minute. The polarity energy, it's like there was a polarity recorrection and identity creation. And what that meant is a lot of men, they look big and beastly, but they were in their feminine energy. Yeah. Yes, and all yes. these women, they looked all pretty in that, but they were in their masculine. So they were the beast and the men were actually, it was actually the other way around. Do you uh, know? And I'm like, wow, this is, this is really interesting. So there's this massive shift of polarity energy. And then it came into a lot of relationships and a lot of marriages and a lot of people that need that. And I'm like, wow, this is, you know, this is, there's, a big, there's a big need for this. And then, and then even through that process of with the retreats, through that time and period, um, I, I broke away from my second fiance um, because I was living in Bali. Um, I was doing a network marketing company at the same time. We were being very successful. And I'm all about helping people and telling people how it is. Yeah, I'm not going to keep people that I don't align with around me because I want to make money and I don't want to, um, you know, I don't, I want to tell, you know, the alignment and I wanted to be, um, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to start a family and I wanted to do that. And unfortunately, um, my ex fiance started seeing things differently, was basically losing her in a way as being a performer on social media. And, you know, from being, you know, we got engaged, from being the family, that put, you know, from having a family, growing and, you know, being wife and husband, that got put to five, you know, you know number five down the line. Yes. So, and I'm like, nah, you know, I can't live with that, you know, and through that process, um, again, on my life was rocked. So from building these empires of, you know, it was Beast Mode Australia, then it was Beast Mode International because it was international, Beauties and the Beast, and having all these, you know, living over in Bali, it was like, well, what do I do now? Because there was a lot of interconnection there. There was a lot of um, businesses, people, network, you know, and, do, and doing that, traveling around. And I'm like, wow, again, um, but I'm in Bali this time. I'm in, um, I'm in this huge big villa, a different mindset, but alone again. And I'm like, what the F do I do? And then again, what do I do? Came back to Melbourne, you know, and it was very hard for me to come back to Melbourne because it was like I was going backwards. But I didn't, I could not go back to my parents' place because I'm like, I'm not doing this again. So I remember I was basically staying at hotel to hotel. Um, and during that time, I'm like, you know, I've got these businesses, I've got all these people, I've got these clients, like, what do I do? You know, it was obviously it was a better situation than I was the first time. But with my mindset, I'm like, well, I need to make some decisions. And in that time, my beautiful fiance that I'm with now, Jaboa, um, who you met, we knew each other way back, like even before my second fiance, and we, you know, we saw each other for a little bit, but we were both, it was the wrong time. Um, and then she, she just came out of a, a breakup after a few months, and I did, she said, oh, I saw you in Melbourne, It'd be great to catch up. And we just really connected, and we were, that, we were that void for each other and that support. At the start, don't get me wrong, it wasn't, it wasn't ro roses and rainbows, it was just, yeah. you know, like it, it wasn't, Oh my God, this is fantastic. It was, I was in the wrong energy. She was, but we were there for each other through the growth and healing process. And during that time, I'm like, what do I do with my life? What do I do? I still want to do this limiting beliefs, you know, limitations, all this stuff started happening. Like, where do I go? Who do I become? And, and it really took me a while. Then we like, hey, you know, we started seeing each other. I was, um, I, where was I staying? I was, I was from hotel to hotel. I never went back to my parents' place because I felt the anxiety of going backwards. And then I slowly started to feel grounded, came back to Melbourne. We moved in together where, where I'm at now. Um, 
And then I started to go, okay, let's, let's, let's see what you want to do again. It's like, it's like the rebuilding blocks again in my life. And yes. it was funny how life, it has a very, you know, it's like a cycle. And it was very, it was almost like, okay, okay, Lee, big shot. Now you think, you know, we're going to give you the same challenge, see how you handle it. Mm-hmm. You know? And I'm so blessed of being able to have the emotional intelligence to practice what I preach, to have that help those thousands of people beforehand. But I think the, I think the biggest thing with that as well was, you know, having the tools of living through it, spending the money on, yes, the education of NLP, master, um, uh, what's it called, matrix energetics, uh, doing a lot of reading, but believing myself that I'm okay who I am, yeah? Not everyone's going to agree. Not everyone's going to, um, they, 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 they're not going to support you and they don't need, not everyone's your friend. And, you know, the interesting thing was, the more that I gave in to go, oh, you know what, I'll just exist, the more I lost my power. The more that I said, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't need this. I don't need to be, you know, having new clients every day and, and making all this money. I need to just be filling me up. I need to become who I want to become. And when I did that, and it was just the purity of me wanting to shine and become that better version of me, everything started to flow. So that's how the flow experience came about. And... I, and I went to I went to a workshop in um, Las Vegas, um, and at that time I was getting coached by Devin Michaels, and he actually lives on the Vegas Strip. And I'm like, you know what? I want to put myself in an environment where I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be the the least one in everything. You know, they're, they're, these guys, I'm like, wow, these are juggernauts, like big business tycoons. So I went there. And it was, it was a pretty good experience. Went to one of these, um, you know, the retreats, not talking about a business. You do a business presentation about what you did. And these guys were like the beast mode. And, and I knew that the beast mode was only for a certain genre. Yes. So I remember the next day, I got a lot of feedback from these business guys. And they said, yeah, it's pretty cool for a small, for a small demographic. And then, then, then I sat down with um, Bajal, who's a very good friend of mine and a mentor. Um, yeah. Davin, um, and, and Davin, and we're at his place in on the Vegas strip and that we're going through a mastermind. And I remember we're looking at, okay, cool. So let's, let's look at the rebranding. And they, and then they said to me, look, with your top five VIP clients, I want you to ask them, where were they before you met them? Where were they during? Where are they now? And what came about? And a lot of them used the word flow. A lot of them used direction. A lot of them used the path to least resistance. A lot of used from going in circles to having, you know, having stability. So then I'm like, wow, that's, you know, and then I remember I watched a video by Stephen Cutler about the, um, he was talking about the flow state. Um, he, was, yeah, yes. he was talking, um, he was talking how he overcome, uh, what's it called? Lyme, Lyme's disease. And he was at, he was in, he was at Google. And I'm like, geez, that's powerful. And all of a sudden, all these things started popping up with flow and this and that. And you can hear people talking about it more and, you know, abundance flows to you and this. And then I'm talking about the flow state, how it hacks the mind. I'm like, wow. Cause as the time change, we need to change with it. Yes. And, then I started applying the flow state to my life, into my training, into, you know, having those breaks and don't just sit there becoming procrastinating. Get up every 30 minutes to do that. You know, using these, um, you know, you can have these special, not, not drugs, that uh, I think they're called nutropotics neutro, or something. It's like a, to get your mind into that flow state and yes. uh, use all these biohacks. And I'm like, let's, let's do that. And it's like, well, creating that ultimate flow experience went to the ultimate flow retreat, which we ran one in January. We're running another one in May and it's actually going to be my 31st retreat. So 30, wow. so, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Now, uh, for, okay. Uh, we're going to talk to, uh, use the remaining like 15 minutes uh, to talk about maybe like if you come across a friend, right. Or one of our listeners here or one of us yes. you know, feeling down and you know, for, for no reason, apparently from the eyes of others. Um, this guy is healthy, everything is going fine, but he just couldn't wake up in the morning. He just couldn't see a purpose in his life. You know, he's doing what he's supposed to do. Yep. Looks on top of everything on the outside. So are there some steps, you know, to, to, to share with these people? Yeah, look, there's sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to get out of bed. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, I'm living a quite a comfortable life. I'm living, you know, I've created some amazing things. Um, you know, I'm just about to be featured on this, on, on the industry leaders, which is going to be on TV. As you said, in the, you know, I'm doing a t- uh, talk in Melbourne tonight. Um, you know, I've got a lot of good things happening. I've got a beautiful partner living that. And some days I don't want to wake up. 
And what happens with that? The reason why that happens is that we need to look at our life. If we aren't growing every day, it's slowly quicksand and we're sinking. And what, what saved my life is daily routines, is my morning routine, is getting up. Don't look at your phone. Don't even have it with you. If it's got music, cool. Don't, don't go for your notifications. Turn them off. And you need to, and I mean you need to, not that you should, you need to program your mind, your supercomputer every day because there's so many influences out there and distractions like people, bills, um, energy, frequency, the media, all these things to condition you to make you confused, angry, and lost. So the thing about you know, the understanding of being able to get up in the morning and program your supercomputer. Even sometimes when I don't feel like getting out of bed, I look at myself in the challenge. Do I want to sleep in or do I want to come the best version of me? And I also say, I've got, I've got a duty of care of being the best version of me. First, it's me and all the people I want to leave. Because, you know, if you're a father, if you're or whatever, whatever you are, you know, you go, hold on a minute. It's not just about me. It's about the people that are looking up to me. It's about, you know, it's about the, you know, people in the world that need me, the people that maybe aren't as strong as me, they need me. And that gets me up. And I always, it's about having empowering routine. So most days I get up between, uh, say, 6 to 6.30. You know, some days I'll do the 5 a.m. club. I haven't been lately, I'll be honest. Um, and, and you get up in the morning. And what I do is I created this morning routine called the success priming. And it's priming your body to get the vibration up because what we are, we're all vib we're vibration, we're moving parts, we're energy. Mm -hmm. And with these tiny little neutrons and protons that are constantly rubbing together, and the more that you get your energy higher, and when you visualize, you're, you're sending out a much stronger, more powerful signal, and it's, and it's starting to integrate a lot more in the subconscious. So I will, con I will focus on all my life areas. And then I will take my awareness to my consciousness, to my knowing, to become the attraction energy, the identity and what livable actions. So I don't just visualize and go, I want, I want a six pack and big muscles. Or I want to be a millionaire. I want to help a million people. I want to have a hot girlfriend in this. I want that. It's not that at all. Mm -hmm. It's about creating what I want now and every day and connecting with it. It's like a GPS system. So I don't want to just go everywhere. I, for, my, for my health goal or my health lifestyle, I'm a separate identity for my wealth, for my contribution, for my family and my legacy, for my self-worth and you know, uh, self-love, my passion and purpose and all that together. Every time I connect with that, that's my spiritual awakening. So I do that every morning. And one thing to actually prepare you for the mornings, like the morning, so you don't, you don't wake up feeling like that, is you go to bed with a, you know how there's a morning routine? Most people yeah. forget what's, what's just as important is a nighttime routine. Right. So having a nighttime routine, two hours or three hours before you go to bed, you shouldn't touch your phone, any white light or your computer. And you can even meditate. Um, what, I, what I taught myself is like reflection. It's called a daily debrief. Yeah. It's a reflection and daily debrief plus setting myself up. And what I do is I focus on from the moment I woke up to the moment I go to sleep and I focus on every activity that I did. And on one side of the, like I'll have a book, two pages to an opening on one side, I'll have written down everything that I did and you know, did I do a good blah, blah, blah. And some of them are not great, but then I will write, okay, on the other page, what do I commit to do? So I'm teaching my mind. Okay. Look, I didn't handle that good. What, what was it? So you're creating the pain point. Then you're doing the solution. Most people, we know where we go wrong, but we're not, we're not programming the solution. And mastering these, your success priming in the morning, after you do your success priming, that's 26, it's, I call it 26, 20, 20, 26 minutes of your success priming, getting your vibration up, moving the body, the, you're getting that. 20 minutes of journaling, which I call writing your life into existence. So whatever you visualize, you put it on paper, and then 20 minutes of learning something in powerful, which is relevant for you. Yes. And that, that gets you started in the day. Even if you're feeling down or suicidal, depressed, you start moving the body and start to, I've got a specific song that I have it. Like, um, I can show you, I'll send you the video one day and yes. you, when you're moving the body, you know, you're getting, it's called the more motion, the more emotion and you're moving the body. You feel visualizing and that disempowering state is no longer there. You feel pumped. You feel alive. You know, you're like, yes, I'm back in control of my life again. And, oh very powerful and then you know it, it's six it cre it's 66 days to create a habit so i've just put most of my clients now on a 66 day challenge to keep doing this wow and and i also remember you you mentioned in another interview that uh, 
you, you take a walk and that walk, like what you say, energy in motion, like you yes. love the, the positive energy. Yep, 100%. Wow. So I, uh, there's, there's two, uh, there's sometimes I will do my success priming in here where I do the slapping. So you, you slap the body to shake it up, to get the vibration up. Yeah, it brings the blood there. Um, yeah, you know, some people do the tapping. I'm, not, I'm doing the tapping. So if you slap your body enough, the body will start to go, like you feel it. Like if you go like that, you start yeah, to feel yeah. the vibration and you're like, but if you keep doing it to a point and you see your body goes red and you start to get the vibration up, and once you start to get the vibration, you're moving the body, you've got the music, you're vibrating like, you feel like you can fly. You're just like, wow. And then wow. The, higher the, the higher the energy output, the higher the information input. So the more energy you put out, the more information you'll take in. You become this magnet to that. And I when, I, when I walk, my, I did that just before I spoke to you as well. I went and did my success priming when I walk because every step that I take, I, I'm taking, like, I, I go to the park close to, the only thing is when you're walking, there's distractions, yeah, cars, people, dogs, and you know, and it's a lot more concentrated if I do it in my office, I do it in my lounge room. Yes. Um, when you walk, it's more you're getting, you can get the flow, you get the creativity going. It's like every step that you're taking, you're getting stronger. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so amazing. Yes, yes. I, I like how you, you know, uh, describe this because it makes so much sense, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, before we end this, right, I just like to repeat a few things that I saw agree with you. Like, also, you know, I recently discovered Dr. Bruce Lipton. Uh, yeah. He talked about how, you know, like what you say, our energy, I mean, our body is just not the physical body, but it also mm -hmm. there's an energy level, there's an energy aspect of our body, which drug companies can never take care of because the drug companies can only take care of the chemical part yes. of our body, but, but not the energy because they can't put it in the capsule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, you know, the tapping and the walking and yeah, success priming makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing is like, we can do it anywhere. Right? Yeah. Yes. And it's all in the mind. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's right. That's right. So uh, I, I can't thank you enough, me, uh, for, for your precious time. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely, I will have to you know, uh, come back with you to you and follow up on a few other things to learn more about it. To yeah. continue picking your brain. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what I'm here for. I, lo I love to share. I'm constantly learning. I've got, in the background, I've got Dr. Joe Dispenza there talking about the placebo effect. And uh, yes, I'm always, always learning. And, um, you know, and that's, that's what we're here for. So now I appreciate it. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I really can click with you and uh, I can relate to, you know, your experience. Although I haven't got the you know, highs and lows that you know, you've been through, but I can relate it with my own challenges. Yep. And I, I think you need to, uh, you know, do more TED Talks and go out there and spread the message to more people. And yep. I will also share this with, you know, my listeners, my friends, you know, and everyone else. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. That's what I wanted to do. I, even when I was doing my success priming today, I, my passion and purpose is to get out there. Today, I'll be doing a talk um, in Chadston for uh, my good friend Wes. He's created an event called Mind Aim. So yes. if anyone wants to get down there, it's going to be cool. We're going to be discussing limiting beliefs and you know how you get over them and some, uh, you know logical uh, exercises. Yes. So it's going to be really cool. Yes, definitely. Yes, it's an amazing event. I've shared that on my social media as well. Oh, beautiful. So yeah, good luck for the talk today. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll catch up again. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that, Ken. I appreciate it, mate. And, um, you know, like, like I said, the, this, is, this is our second time doing it, but I think it even flowed even more. More good stuff came out. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And thank you so much. We'll get in touch. Yes. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.